you. No worries. Thanks, everyone, for organizing this, and thanks for coming. I appreciate uh, your time. So I'm Adam, uh, CEO and founder of Redocly, and I am going to talk uh, today, tonight, this morning, wherever you are, um, about taking an idea to an API. So how do we um, do that? I saw from the survey that um, not too many of us in the uh, in the call are experienced uh, or very experienced with open API, which is uh, what I'm going to be uh, using. So I'll take a little bit of extra time to walk through um, that a little bit, but I won't dive too deep. Um, but I'm going to uh, hope you enjoy this. If you have some questions, feel free to ask them in the chat and Deborah's going to uh, interrupt me or I'll take some pauses mm -hmm. and uh, see if I can help out. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen. So can everybody see my screen? Just give me a little thumbs up or yes. We can see it. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Great. So I'm going to start off with what makes a good API? The most important thing is an API needs to solve a problem. An API has to be well documented or else people can't use it. It has to have good error handling and it should be reliable and predictable. Uh, what does that mean? It kind of means that someone should know what to expect. So if they've started using an API, one part of an API, and then they move on to another part, they kind of expect it to behave in the same way, so to be consistent. So I was thinking for um, this talk, what are some meaningful problems to solve? Where are my keys? Which t-shirt should I wear? I've got like five different Redocly shirts. What's for dinner? And what should I do with my life? And I was thinking, well, you know, I'm kind of hungry, so what's for dinner has my full attention. So I focused on that. Uh, all APIs should solve a problem. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of up to the market uh, to, uh, you know, either need that solution or not. And, and for you to, or whoever the producer of the API is, to explain what this API is doing and what it's solving so that people can decide whether or not they want to use it. So I was thinking about the audience for my API. So each API should have some kind of audience, the, the end user who's going to benefit from the API. I was thinking about um, in terms of dining out, someone that dines out rarely, they, they're rarely doing takeout or delivery. So this is focused on someone that's staying in and cooking often, maybe three to six evenings per week. I found this survey and the survey um, said that 45% uh, of people dislike cooking, 10% uh, love to cook, 45% are lukewarm. You know, I think this survey kind of um, matches me kind of 100% of the time. So I'd say that 45% of the time I dislike cooking, 10% of the time I love it, and 45% of the time I'm lukewarm. But this is kind of our, our target audience, people that are kind of lukewarm about uh, cooking. Then in terms of the behaviors, so an API is is there to help someone uh, uh, do something or help uh, you know, accomplish a task. So I call those behaviors. And, and what is this behavior of this API? Maybe it would help someone buy ingredients from a market, whether it's grocery or farmer's markets, and cook recipes based on available ingredients that they have on hand. So uh, why aren't the people who hate cooking in your audience? So that's, that's a good question. So if you, if you look back here, the 45% of the people that hate cooking. So an API is usually like 
an API can't be everything to everyone. So that's why it's important to pick your audience. And uh, you know, it's it's not possible to please everyone. So you you if you can focus on a segment and serve them better than you can the whole circle, that segment's going to benefit from uh, your API. So that's why we see so many APIs or this um, you know explosion in APIs because a lot of APIs are better for specific segments, maybe not for the entire population as a whole or all companies or you know business APIs or whatever, but the um, they're serving a specific segment. Um, so in terms of APIs, they also usually involve information. People are sending information in or getting information out or some combination of the two. So we need to know what ingredients, tools, appliances are available. How many people are we cooking for? If there are any dietary restrictions, any preferences, any nutritional goals. What's in the kitchen? Starts to feel like a lot of things to track. Ingredients, quantity of an ingredient, a use by date. So we want to use our ingredients before they go bad. But I don't know many recipes myself. I, I kind of have a, a fixed set of recipes that I tend to follow. And I did some search and I found quite a few uh, cooking APIs, recipe APIs, like this one from Spoonacular. And I saw they have an API where you can search recipes by ingredients. And you can also get ingredient substitutes. So if you have almost all of the ingredients, but you're missing one or two in particular, you can find if there are any substitutes for it. And I think my, my initial vision was um, uh, too big and too broad. So I've decided to pull out uh, the scope hammer. What's a scope hammer? It's kind of a um, uh, what by when uh, question. So what are we going to do by when? And what we're saying is we're giving ourselves a fixed amount of time and a variable scope. So we say, OK, I can't describe all of those behaviors and create an API for that. By the time I have to give this talk, so I have to pull out the scope hammer and reduce the scope. So um, uh, I uh, did that. And I decided that this what's for dinner API won't actually do anything uh, with recipes, but it's going to be um, more of a what's in my kitchen. So the real problems that I'm trying to solve here is one, who has time to enter all of their ingredients? Like I, I know I can't go through my fridge and my pantry and the, my spice rack uh, and uh, you know, enter in all of my ingredients one by one. I'd be spending as much time doing that as I'd be cooking for the rest of the month. So um, I thought this API would have to do something that would allow me to, to speed that up. So um, I thought it could analyze pictures of things like pantries, fridges, spice racks, rece receipts from the grocery store. So I could take a picture of it and it would know everything that I bought and it could keep track of what I have on hand. And then I need to know who's keeping track of what needs to be used by when, because I hate when something goes bad and then I have to throw it away. I always feel guilty when that happens. And so I'm, I'd like to be able to get alerts before something goes bad so that I can uh, you know, prioritize that. And then I need to know what's actually used because if I'm just tracking what I'm acquiring and I don't track what I use, uh, we won't know what I actually have available. So we need to track what I either eat, dispose of, donate, or um, you know, cook. So 
So this brings us to the API ideas. So this is how I start to form uh, an API. So I've, I've summarized the problems and the solutions are, are written in terms of little API requests. So uh, what do we have? So the solution here is a, a post, uh, there's HTTP, meth HTTP methods and uh, there's uh, a bunch of them, but a few important ones like post, get, delete. So post is sending information in typically. Uh, put is uh, also sending information in, but it's to update a specific resource, uh, update or create a specific resource uh, by its identifier. Get is to get either a specific resource or a collection of items. And, and I'm only using here post and get, so I won't uh, go on. The, uh, here I post, I wanna be able to take a picture and send it in, so post that in to the system. And I want the system to send me back some information, maybe what uh, it's deciphered my uh, picture and it's figured out, you know, it's, it's um, listed a list of all my ingredients. Uh, so next, use by when. Uh, so I want to be able to get a collection of ingredients and I want it sorted by the use by date so I know what I have to use first or next. Then what did we use? post uh, ingredients, be able to, to submit what ingredients I used or take pictures of my food that I cooked or just post the recipes and it would know from the, uh, the recipes how much I've used. So now off to the demo. So uh, to, uh, to start, I start with a, a starter repository. And the starter repository is uh, the Redockly Open API Starter. Uh, there's a key file in there, which is the openapi.yaml file. This file is where uh, the open API definition uh, starts. And the way that I like to organize APIs is in a multi-file format. So you see folders over here on the side and there's a folder for paths and there's a folder for components and let me open up the schemas. So uh, th these are the things to me that are most important to composing an API. So, and but it's all linked to from what's called the root which is this openapi.yaml file. So as I scroll down here, we'll come across the paths section. So this um, format is uh, uh, complying with the open API specification version three as 3.0, as we see at the top. Uh, so there's these different sections that you can add. And this can be written in different ways. I'm using YAML because it's a lot easier to write markdown in YAML. Uh, it can also uh, be written in JSON, so, but it's then more difficult to write markdown because you have to put it into a single line. So uh, if you have uh, a longer description, and for example, here I even take a description from another file. Uh, if you have something like this, it's, it's much more complex to do in uh, uh, JSON because you basically have to make everything uh, on a single line, which means you're putting in uh, these little um, uh, things which, which indicate a line break. So next, um, let me go back to the open AP5 file. So the path section, a path is like what some people call an endpoint in uh, vernacular. It seemed like a lot of half of the audience was familiar, actually more than half, two thirds of the audience 
was either very or somewhat experienced with writing API docs. So I think you're probably mostly familiar with the concepts, but maybe not the specification uh, itself. So the so an endpoint is where a request would be sent. This forms part of a URL in combination with the server. So if someone was going to send a request to this photos endpoint, they would actually be sending a request to the combination of these two, like that. So those two get joined together, uh, the servers and the paths. So then where we see this dollar ref, this is what's called a reference object. And what this is doing is it's pointing to another file. And this is really handy because while this API isn't very big because I just started it, um, it would be, uh, it would probably be, uh, I don't know, maybe a thousand lines of YAML all together. And, but because I've uh, decided to organize it into separate files, into its own concerns, it's actually quite manageable to open any file and not be overwhelmed by a giant YAML file and being uncertain about where you are in terms of indentation, uh, which, which is something that uh, even though I use YAML all the time, uh, you know, concerns me. <laughs> so I, um, uh, so this, for example, is pointing to this reference. So it's pointing to this paths photos.yaml file. So I'll go to that file. So in the paths folder, the photos.yaml uh, file, this is describing the HTTP method, which is the post request that I mentioned. So this is going to be for sending information in. I've added a tag, which is adding ingredients. And I've added a summary, just upload a photo. I've given the operation an ID. So in OpenAPI, they call um, each combination of a path and an HTTP method an operation. And that's something that, that they use in their terminology. And I've become accustomed to it over uh, years of practice. So because I, haven't, I hadn't heard that term uh, prior to using it. And then you can determine security for the API, write a description. This is accepts markdown. I didn't use any fancy markdown features, but I could have. I could have made this bold uh, or given it emphasis. Um, it has a it may have a request body because this is a post request. It 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 makes sense for it to. It could have different content types. I've used two different possible content types for this one, a form data, or the request could be sent using the JSON format. And the actual content of the request matches this schema, which is another dollar ref. So I'm using the reference object again. And we'll see I actually use the same thing for the request for each of these and the response, the successful response. I didn't add any error, uh, errors uh, handling in to this API yet. So, so the next uh, step is to go through uh, and find this photo.yaml schema. And let's take a look at what that looks like. So I found this photo.yaml uh, schema here inside of the schemas component schemas folder. And I organize these folders in this way because that's the way that the OpenAPI specification itself is organized. It's got a components section and in components there's schemas and there's other things as well, like headers and, and um, well, I've got a little readme here. We've got uh, responses, parameters, uh, examples, request bodies, links, callbacks, and security schemes. The schemas are where a lot of the work uh, goes. Uh, Richard, you ask a, a good question. How long does this uh, take to create all this? And I'm going to answer that uh, near the end. Fantastic question. I actually have a uh, uh, some content about that. So uh, 
now if we're looking through here, we've got um, uh, this is this complies to something called JSON schema. It's a way to describe different schemas. And this tells us that this is an object. There's a couple required uh, properties, properties like a field. And uh, one of them being the kitchen ID, the other one being the file. And then this describes the different properties in this object. Some of them you can see are marked as read only. So those would only show in the response because they're not part of the request. Uh, and you can, again, use markdown inside of the descriptions. And here I use a little markdown feature, the little, uh, I think it's called the back tick to indicate this is code or represent it like, like a code uh, snippet. And this one is write only. So we'll only see this in the request and not in the response. And so now let's let's go ahead and we can uh, take a look at what uh, the docs would look like. So here I'll click open up the API. This is running on my my local host. That little command I wrote start a little server, so we can see what's for dinner. So here is the API that, and I'll just scroll through it briefly, and we can find that um, upload a photo here that we were looking at. We could open up the response and we can see these read-only properties that I mentioned in this file, which was write-only, it doesn't appear in the response. Um, and we see that as well in the, in the request and response samples, same in the, you know, if we, if we wanna look at some code sample as well. So uh, this is how we started with writing the, um, uh, designing the API. But one of the most important parts of designing the API is actually the, the quick start guide. How is someone actually going to use the API? And the quick start guide is probably the best place to get started if uh, you're a consumer of an API and probably if you're an API producer, writer, API um, documentarian. So uh, let's go ahead. And I started a, another project, which is a developer portal. And actually, I think I have it already running in a tab here. So here I've got my, my quick start guide, which let me zoom in a little bit. Um, which uh, walks me through how I would expect someone to possibly use this uh, API to make sure it's just kind of like a, a test um, of sorts. Can someone read this and is the API, does it seem usable? Um, so documenting uh, APIs as part of the design process is really important because it leads to designing better APIs. And when you design better APIs, people are more likely to use them. And when they use them, then they're more likely to be successful. And then you're more likely to create more APIs. And so this is uh, really important. There's for there to be this uh, uh, kind of uh, cooperation between the documentation of APIs and the design of APIs. Uh, an API that has a very complex quick start indicates that there is a problem with the API. And that would indicate that we need to improve the design. And one of the most challenging things to do is change an API. So that leads to discussions of API versioning and there's many different strategies around versioning. Uh, when an API, an API is also like a legal contract in some ways, maybe you've heard this before. Uh, when, once someone is using an API, they've integrated to it, they've written code, it's going to work with it. But there is, um, there is a lot of, uh, 
uh, a lot of it, it will it will um, uh, it could cause a lot of damage to those consumers if that API changes and it breaks their integration. So uh, that's that's why it's important to design a good API up front, and that's why documentation has to really be prioritized uh, during the design process of an API. So um, now this is a, a developer portal that I'm running on my local host. It's got a combination of some, some guides, which I haven't really written, a quick start guide, and API reference docs, which uh, you know we uh, we were just kind of previewing. So this is uh, effectively the end result. Now, how would I typically uh, work or collaborate? Usually, I'm not doing something like this by myself. I'm working, and I'd be working and collaborating with a team, even if it's a small team. And I would usually use a source control provider. I uh, tend to use GitHub. So I've created two repositories here. One uh, the, with the API that I was just showing, and one with the um, uh, developer portal. And the developer portal is consuming the API. I've pushed uh, the, uh, the API. I've connected that repository into uh, Redockly's API registry. So if I go and make a change to the API, it's going to make a change, uh, a corresponding change in this registry. And I haven't made any changes since I've added this uh, to the registry. I could create reference docs in, uh, from the registry with a couple clicks. And this is going to build a copy of the docs like I was running in localhost, but now I can share it with people. Other people can see it. I can click. Uh, to visit it, and I can see my docs here. Now, if I click my logo, I see, ooh, you know what? I I didn't uh, change my uh, my URL. So let me go and do that right now. So here, I'm going to switch back to my API. I'll go to my openapi.yaml, and that URL is a link from the contact. So here I'm going to go. I'm going to change this with docs. What's for dinner. Dev. Now I'm going to save this. Uh, I'll go ahead and make a new tab. Uh, uh, I'll call it URL. Okay. So here, what I'm doing is I'm I'm making a new branch uh, in Git, and now I'm going to add a commit, and I'm writing a commit message. Should be probably a little bit more specific, uh, and now I'm pushing it into uh, into GitHub. So here I see the branch that I just pushed. Now I can can compare it. I can see the change I made. I can create a pull request. I can ask people for a review. Is this good? Is this bad? OK, seems like it's. it might be good. But let's wait for um, the, the validation. And here is. Uh, what happened? It validated that the API was still valid against the specifications and some other governance rules that were configured. It bundled it into a single file. So if you're wondering what it what it looks it would look like in a single file, this is what it would look like combined into a single file. And it built me a preview of the docs. And it's going to build a preview of the entire developer portal as well. So here's a preview of uh, the docs. And what I can do is I can go and I can click on the logo now to check it. And it takes me to the right website. So it looks good. Um, and so what tool are we using to validate? We're using our tool, uh, Redockly's tool called OpenAPI CLI. And that is um, 
uh, configured in this .readDocly.yaml file. So here I'm extending the extent the uh, recommended rule set, which includes some uh, common uh, API. I don't know what to call them. I guess AP, common API design hygiene practices. Uh, this can be extended further by writing custom uh, rules, uh, and there's other things that that you can do, but that's kind of an advanced topic. I'm happy to, to um, talk more about later. Um, so uh, Redocly is acting like a CI CD in this case. We are integrated with uh, GitHub, GitLab, and Bitbucket, and Azure repos. And so we uh, receive a webhook, we have this app, and it receives a webhook from GitHub in this case when a commit is made. And then it builds, um, it does these things, and then we send the status report back. And so if I click on this, I can see that there will be some, it'll link me to the build logs until the build is complete. And then it will, um, and this is for building of, of the developer portal. Once that build is complete, it will take me to, uh, um, take me to the... Uh, uh, You're getting some questions about whether or not the code samples for various languages are generated automatically. Yes, so I, did I know not write that. This. No, no, <laughs> but but I was just letting um, Rohit know that that Redocly does in the does generate those examples in the different languages. Yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah. So uh, if we if we go to our um, API in here, we'll just open up one, adding an agreement, an ingredient. So these are all written by. Um, let me zoom in a little bit. Uh, these are written by us, and it's what it's it's doing is it's taking a combination of the uh, uh, the example that was defined for in the Open API definition. So I actually did not explicitly define an example, mm -hmm. but what I did was I defined examples on the schema. So here I had the file, and I put this example value. And I had the, um, what else, was there a kitchen ID? And I put an example value. So that's why uh, we see the Altman family kitchen. I'm Adam Altman, so <laughs> the Altman family is my kitchen. Yeah. And uh, so here's the uh, example that happens. And it, it, it will work across any of these uh, requests. And then there's also a try it. So we could try the API, except I didn't make any um, uh, any backing service. So the try it won't actually uh, work. Adam, would that allow one to enter their own uh, variables and key values and see how how that works? Or yeah, how so would the try it now functionality work? You can enter your own variables. For mm -hmm. example, I just put that. This is a GET request. There's not much um, there, but we can go back to the uploading a, a photo, and we can try it. And so, in the body, I could change this. I could I could um, change it to you know um, any any value there that I want. Uh, you know, if we wanted to change the the file, this is a base sixty four encoded file. So that's not really um, going to be human readable, but I could change it to a someone someone else's kitchen uh, and uh, do that before I send it. So that's common. Uh, most of the time people would be um, changing these values, but uh, for, a, for a serious developer portal, you would probably be integrating the sen someone's identity and you know who they are so that they could log into the portal. And then when they know who you are, you could replace this. So I could replace it with the Eskenazi family kitchen, right? And uh, so if it was you looking at the website versus me, I would see the Altman family kitchen or the Rock family kitchen or et, et cetera. So that's um, uh, how this uh, you know, could, could work. Uh, and, and, and what would make for a better consumer experience is to get samples, um, and try it functionality that is uh, tailored to the reader. 
personalized to them so that they can, um, you know, most, uh, most efficiently accomplish and better understand their, the, um, the code. So if they were to copy this and paste it, they'd have less things that they would have to change. Mm -hmm. You know, you could have their authorization pre-filled in already, things like that. So I see um, another question here from Richard. Uh, are, I, I'm not sure if you still want to hold questions to the end or if you want to sprinkle them in more. There were some that you were answering on your own, but. Yeah, I'm, um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to answer some questions. So I just merged this. So this is what's going to happen is now I'm, I've, I'm going to trigger a release uh, in, in production, updated docs. So uh, do I work with external tools like Postman? I do sometimes. Uh, I, d I don't work with them very often, but I do sometimes work with Postman. Um, so as I, let's find our what's for dinner website. So I added this page uh, to the what's for dinner website. And this is to share with you all how I use my time to build this and what my approach was. Mm. Um, so I'll zoom in because I know I've got a giant screen. Uh, so mm. I spent about one hour uh, on the Google Slides outline. So a, a lot of that time was brainstorming the questions that were important to me uh, and questions that I thought might resonate with uh, people. And uh, then I corresponded with a designer. Uh, thanks, Vlad, who's not here right now. But um, uh, uh, Vlad helped me make the slides look good. And he actually crafted, uh, you know, made quite a few illustrations to make them look really nice. I, I spent some time refining the slides, probably about an hour. Um, I wrote a draft quick start guide. It's really rough. Uh, I spent about 30 minutes on it, but I felt like it was good enough for this API to, for me to continue to the next level of the design. So I spent about two hours on rough design and reworking the design of APIs. As you do something, I just probably, um, the same with anything that any of you, I'm talking to a bunch of uh, uh, people that write. So you probably have experienced writing something and revising it as you're writing something, um, uh, you know, many times. And um, uh, and then two hours. Uh, so two hours doing that. So and and what all that happened was inside of this. So it was creating these uh, schemas and creating these paths and just wiring those paths into the openapi.yaml file and also some extra stuff like adding some names and uh, tag names and descriptions. And um, so uh, next was uh, a minor amount of time it, I did minor developer portal setup. I primarily copied our, our developer portal starter and I changed the color. I didn't do much there. And I added in, uh, I added the API to the registry. That's a very quick process uh, in, in Redockly that, that um, takes a, just a couple minutes of connecting to for example, I, I connect to the GitHub repository and I chose my organization. I chose my repository, which was uh, what's for dinner API. And I chose my branch and I chose the path to my root file. And, and then that was, that was pretty much it uh, to get started. And this is how I could add another version if I had legitimate other version, I could do that, but then it's pretty much done. It will uh, lint uh, that really quickly. 
Um, yes, the registry is what sets up the Redockly CI CD in the, in the GitHub build. Uh, someone asked, could I share a link to the GitHub actions? I didn't actually use any GitHub actions. This is 100% a Redockly's app, Redockly's GitHub app. So um, Redockly's GitHub app does that validation. And I could look at the validation logs. One of the nice things is, is um, it's easy to make mistakes in OpenAPI and to get a clearer um, feedback about those mistakes. Uh, it's, it's presented here uh, in a, so we uh, detect various problems and we parse them and we show them. So that's, that's one of the things that, that I like. Uh, so, so back to, to here, um, I added the portal to the, uh, uh, it's, it's, it was the same sort of process connecting a Git repository. I set up a custom domain. So in my, um, in my app here, I just went to my portal, I added this portal. And then in the settings, I, I set up this custom domain docs.whatsfordinner.dev. And I set it up in my domain registrar to point a C name to this uh, URL. And then I spent about 30 mi minutes doing a practice run of this presentation and uh, 30 minutes writing this page <laughs> about uh, what I did. And here it is in uh, some more details. Uh, and this website is public. It's available if you want to check it out after the talk. I also have links in here uh, to the repositories, which are public too. So you can check out the What's for Dinner API repository and the What's for Dinner, uh, which is the developer portal API um, repository as well. So, and and with that, those are my, those are the takeaways that. I'm uh, giving you all and, and just seeing if you have any questions. Um, so if you wanted to incorporate CI CD like link checkers, markdown linters, veil, could I use the registry or could it integrate with a different tool like Netlify? Good question. Um, so uh, the tool is, is really, um, I guess similar in some ways to Netlify, but more purpose specific for API definitions and um, developer portals. Uh, you could add um, addition. You could add a GitHub action, for example, to do a markdown lint. Um, we are actually in the process of adding a broken link checker and broken image checker, um, but you could uh, add a GitHub action to do that as well. Um, and there's a lot of good uh, broken link, broken link uh, checkers available uh, to to do that. Um, we don't yet have a uh, a guide or tutorial for how to set set up a broken link link checker or something like Veil. Um, we're also thinking about incorporating Veil into our developer portal product specifically um, to uh, be able to run. Uh, automated veil checks. Um, uh, so people get a sense of grammar and spelling uh, errors and get feedback on that early. Um, so I, I will stop sharing my screen, but here to answer questions. So Rohit asks, what are typical boundaries for a writer and the developer in documenting APIs using Redockly. To better put it, typically what are inputs from the developers in this case, a YAML or something similar, something else. So this is actually really varies across organizations and it's, it's pretty interesting. So some organizations actually have documented their, they haven't really documented their APIs, right? And there's a disconnect between innovation and documentation. So maybe they've documented the APIs uh, at a point in time, but APIs aren't static and it's constantly, they're constantly evolving. So they have a, a, like a static PDF of what their APIs were like two years ago. Um, and they may have deviated from that or drifted apart. And so uh, 
there's this gap that needs to be closed and, and connected. That's why we really believe in the um, GitHub uh, style automation uh, to close that gap between uh, documentation and collaboration. The, um, uh, so uh, what we see in some successful cases are developer development teams Yes, maybe they're pushing the YAML files or 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 generating them in some way, and uh, documentation uh, writers are contributing to the descriptions primarily. So they're um, whether it's the uh, at different levels in terms of the open API. That's the info description, the tag description. And each property scheme of property operation description and scheme of property descriptions. Those are the different levels of descriptions, things that need to be described. Uh, so, uh, uh, well, a workflow that we might see is that a developer uh, or a product manager sometimes opens up a pull request to propose a, a new API or a change to an API, and then they'll get feedback from a technical writer and a developer someone who's going to implement that, and that helps shape a better API so that when the API is actually developed, uh, it's, it's really ready to be released because the documentation is ready. Now, the full documentation might not be ready, but the reference documentation is from that perspective because full documentation might include something like a guide. So uh, reference docs, are great if you don't have any documentation, reference docs seem fantastic. Um, but if you have uh, reference docs, it, it kind of feels like you went to a library and they, oh, they only have dictionaries there. And you, you, um, if you've ever been to another library, you've, you realize you're missing out on a lot of things. Uh, so now if you've never been to a, a library that had anything besides a dictionary, then you don't, you know, you, you're just not aware. And I think part of what uh, we're seeing is that uh, more people are going to different libraries and they're, and they're aware that, oh, there's a lot of different types of content that, you know, could exist uh, for APIs that will help make it a better, more rich experience for our consumers and our producers in some case, because documentation is really great. Uh, uh, we're usually looking at it from the from the consumer perspective, but it's great from a producer perspective if you're bringing someone new onto a team or anything like that. It really helps them understand what they're doing. Uh, so, Adam, thank you so much. Um, this has been a really comprehensive uh, view of how. Uh, API writers and developers can take advantage of Redocly. Um, is there anybody else that has any more questions for Adam tonight? Here, one last question. If I want to use JSON instead of YAML, do we need to tweak Redocly? No, you don't, you don't need to. It works with either because both are um, compliant with the specification. So the specification says you can use JSON or YAML, and uh, so either of them will work. Wonderful. Any more? Um, well, I just wanted to thank you so much for, we're a little over time, so I didn't want to keep, keep obligate people to stay um, too long, although I'm enjoying it. Um, and I really thank you for sharing Redocly with the West Coast Forum. Um, I, uh, see. I think that we're going to do a little bit of breakout rooms. Um, you of course don't need to stay, but we are going to organize breakout rooms according to, uh, individual meetup. Um, I wanted to, again, thank Adam and thank Alyssa for making this possible and creating the zoom call for us. And, um, we're really happy to have been able to have Reed Dockley here tonight and share with everybody how easy API documentation can be using Reed Dockley. So thank you for that. 
Thank you so much, Adam. Jazz hands from everybody. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate I appreciate awesome. it. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah. It's great.